Hey, um, so I'm going to do chapter 52 on um, the videos just because it has. When we are talking about population ecology, a couple of things we're looking at is what is the influence on of the environment on the size of the population itself and also vice versa. Um, so what are the limiting factors? Remember when we talked about carrying capacity, there are some limiting factors to the size of a population. And on the other hand, as, a pop, as the population grows or even goes uh, down in numbers, they also influence the environment. So there is a selective pressure that happens on both ends. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at mm, population density, obviously, um, the distribution, um, how are they distribu distributed within the environment they live in. In apes, we talked about clumped, evenly distributed, dispersed, and all of those things. So we're just going to review that stuff. Age structure. Um, we will be doing a lab in apes later on about demographic analysis. Um, so, for example, if you take um, countries like Japan, they have like an inverted pyramid. There are more old people compared to yeah, and less young people. So, how is the age um, distributed? In terms of mostly, we will be concentrating on reproductive age um, males and females within a population and difference in the population size. Like, what is the trade off an organism has to make in order to have an appropriate population size? So, when they have a large population, they do have certain benefits, but they have certain disadvantages. Um, if they have a very small population, again, it's the same way. So. Organisms have to make a certain trade-off to increase the fitness of their population. That Please remember that word, fitness of the population. How well that population is able to adapt to its environment and how, what is its fecundity, which means reproduction. Um, oh, those are cute. Um, now, we will look at different types of migratory animals. Um, and also different impact uh, impact of different things, uh, different environmental features on the population size. Again, we've talked about this. Uh, a population is the group of individuals of a single species occupying up a general area. So human beings occupy the whole of Earth, except the water portion of it. Um, so that would be our population um again like we said like i said we are all the same species regardless of color creed and whatever other things density is how many people are living in a particular unit of area for example i think the parts like india and the, the most densely populated part of the world is bangladesh um that means there's more people living within a square mile in bangladesh than there is in anywhere in the, anywhere else for example within the united states i think it might be california but i may be wrong on that um oh no 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 i am wrong on that i think it's i think it, it is new jersey new jersey has a high density of population but then when you go to the midwest if you go to wyoming there's like four people living in the whole state so they have a very low density um so in, in terms of size, again, in terms of size, Alaska is a very, very big state. They also have a pretty high population, but their density is very low. So how do you get density to the number of people living there divided by the amount of land they have? I'll give you that. On um, dispersion, how are the different patterns in which the organisms are distributed across that area in which they live? For example, we are pretty, pretty much within the... Uh, five continents, taking out a lot of Antarctica and Arctic, were pretty much evenly distributed. Some continents having more, some continents having less, but, but you know, on an average, we're pretty much evenly distributed. I mean, some countries having more, some countries having less, but evenly more, pretty much evenly distributed through the five different continents. Now, can we get the exact density of population of a place? Again, you can take the number of individuals living, the square footage of land, divide those two things, and you will get the 
absolute density. Like if I want to take the density of get the density of the United States, I would take the number of people living in the United States and the amount of inhabitable land that we have and divide those two things and I could get a density. Is that going to be accurate? No. Certain states are going to have a high density. Certain states are going to have a low density. But it is, it, it's, it's possible, but it's kind of difficult to accomplish. You'll have to do it state by state, region by region, street by street. So I'll, it's just too much work. So we just take like a brass line a baseline uh, number for this um not only that like getting population census um numbers um is not very easy because when you're yeah, like when when people go around doing census doesn't mean that they're going to get all the different individuals living um there are so many reasons as to why people may not want to be a part of the census and i'm not going to go into all of that stuff but it the way you get to that 7 billion number is mostly extrapolation. It's not that somebody has gone and counted everybody. Um, so, a couple of things also, um, density is also um, impacted by two very, by, by a few things. Um, when, when you have a birth, that adds to the population. When you have a death, that obviously subtracts from the population. When you have immigration, that is that is organisms coming into that location, you, that increases the density of population. And when you have emigration, when organisms are leaving that place, you have a decrease in uh, um, the, the density of population. So if you want to find the density, you have to take the total number um, organisms that were born, add the number of organisms that were born, add the number of organisms that had immigrate, uh, and immigrated and subtract the number of organisms that died and subtract the number of organisms that immigrated and that will give you a number. Is it possible? Yes. Does is it time consuming? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of social factors because this is AP biology and not environmental science. Um, the, so patterns of dispersion, we've talked about this in the past. Um, clumped patterns where you have little, uh, um, a few organisms inhabiting one area and then for, usually these are group animals. So if you, if you take, uh, wolves, you could have a pack of wolves living in a certain area and then there's a huge swath of land in the middle that's completely uninhabited by wolves and then it's somewhere else because the clumped dispersion is usually seen with pack animals and very territorial animals. Um, and it also depends to a great degree on what kind of resources they have. You cannot have a place where there's 200, 300 packs of wolves living in the same area. They will die of starvation because there's not enough food to support them. Um, so the limiting factor here is space and food. Um, a pack is going to need a lot of space, not just in order, or not only for hunting, they're also going to need space for uh, mating, taking care of their young ones. They need to form like a, a protection uh, territory around themselves. So all of these reasons is why they have clumped dispersion. Again, remember whenever you're looking, if you're asked to if you're asked if this certain or organism is um, clumped or uh, clumped or not your answer you, you should look at the organism and see if they are um pack animals and um mostly predators do it on non-predators also do it you have like pack like herds of wildebeests in one area and how much resources they need how big the pack is depends on what size they are Rule of thumb, just go for a pack animal. Uh, uniform dispersion where they have, and it's usually, they take up the whole area they're living in. Like for example, penguins, um, there's a small, a small area and they take up the whole area. And they're usually, you could consider, they're not really pack animals, but they still are social animals. And there is a lot of, Again, here there's a lot of territorial um, territoriality, just like the previous one that we talked about, clumped. But it's a bigger group that's able to interact with each other. However, they are kind of confined to a smaller area. Um, so any place where you have plants do this, well, you know, they they take up, they can be uniformly distributed within a certain area. Um, again. The difference between the first one and the second one is that the first one actually has smaller groups and packs um, or herds. Um, they're also social animals, this, but they have a more uh, widespread um, 
ecosystem that they use as a more widespread location that they can live in. They're more generalist than being very specific. Um, these guys are very specific. They have a small area and they are uniformly spread within that area. Um, human beings are a part of this, but we are still we are generalists, but we're also pretty uniformly spread. If you take out the two continents where, where there's not a lot of human beings. Uh, random dispersion, these guys, these usually tend to be individual uh, individuals that live independent from other individuals. So they're not pack animals, they're not herds. Um, they could have um, plants are very famous for this because their um, reproduction is very much dependent sometimes on unless it's insects, even with insects, it works the same way. Um, if it is dependent on wind dispersion or water, um, then they could be spread out in various different places. These organisms are usually generalists. They can live in different places. Um, they're well suited to live in different places. They could be a part of primary successions for a lot of um, the different places. Demographic analysis is how we calculate the population, usually death rates and birth rates. And we just, I just talked about it this in, in the previous slide. So if you're trying to get the number of a population, you need to take all the living individuals, that is adult individuals that are there, um, babies and all of that, add the birth rate, um, and then subtract the death rate, add the immigration rate, and subtract the emigration rate. Now, in biology, we tend to construct a lot of life tables to see at what rate, um, at what age the survivability is the is the highest, and at what or what age the population like starts dwindling out. That is, the members of the population starts dwindling dwindling out. The best way to do this is to actually take a cohort of some kind of animal. So, let's say you were following wolves, you would take a the, the a, pick a pack, like let's say in Alaska, and you would follow it over a course of time to see what are the various things, like what is the survivability of the young ones? What is the survivability of the older ones? After what age do they tend to die off more? Like where is it that their strength starts debilitating, they don't get enough food and they die out? Or little ones, what are the different predators of the little ones? And what is the average lifespan? Because remember, in biology, we're more concerned about that the reproductive age population than anything else. So you're looking at different part, different aspects of life and trying to find out what is the average survivability of an organism in that age group. Um, the best way to do it is to follow an organism, um, follow a pack of or animals over a period of time and find this out because over a period of time every year they'll probably give birth to some animals some animals will die because of predation some will die because of disease and they'll be replaced so it might a, a good population would be a net zero the number of organisms dying and the number of organisms being born which should be relatively similar so this kind of gives you um i'm going to go to the next slide where you can actually see the graph of the survival. So, if you look at this graph, I hope you can. Uh, okay, if you look at this graph, where they're assuming that all the babies at you know zero months are born, and then there is a steady decline in the number of organisms and number of organisms that are live. By the time they come to ten, you can actually see where there is a sharp drop off. This is because the 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 fitness of the organism has reduced um obviously females live longer than males males tend to have a short drop at um uh, between four and six at five years old they're almost you know there's very few of them left um so this is on the log scale now the interesting part is to see the type of survival human beings have compared to um, other organisms. If you look at human beings, they have a pretty um, a large number of them that are born uh, tend to live, and they live a relatively constant life. And then once they come closer to like 80, 90, they tend to uh, drop off. So this is this is kind of indicative of human beings population, which is almost like an inverted. Um, 
like that one half of an inverted par um, parabola, right? Yeah. Um, I may be wrong on that. Um, and whereas the squirrels have a more steady uh, growth, the number of organisms living and dying in bed. And they count 100, they're almost zero. Um, mollusks. Now, these guys are very interesting considering how, if you look at this, how many of the little ones are actually killed off. Um, how how quickly the, the growth rate like goes down. That's because these guys lay their eggs in water and fertilization takes place outside.